Welcome to the New Trust Economy, where your hosts, Blockchain 101 author and founder of Rise Housing, Monica Profit, and Inc. innovation columnist and brand casting strategist, Tracy Hazard, explore all things blockchain, ICO ventures, and cryptocurrency. Each week, they explore businesses, applications, and venture built on blockchain or cryptocurrency and address issues like women and diversity in tech, trust and distrust, and the economics of access and value. We would like to remind our listeners that investing in disruptive tech, ICOs, and cryptocurrency is speculative in nature and involves substantial risk of loss. We encourage you to invest carefully and do your due diligence first. Now, here's today's host, Monica Profit. Hello and welcome to the New Trust Economy. I'm Monica Profit and I am here with Sirat Patil. Did I get that right, Sid? Yes, you did. Awesome. Um, of Comdex. So thank you so much for joining us. I'm glad that I got your name right. I definitely was worried about it. And uh, it's not it's not spelled phonetically, of course. So I, I'm glad I got that um, correct. Thank you so much for being here and also for telling us more about Comdex and your latest project. Um, I mean, where do I begin? It sounds like you're really bridging CFI and DeFi. So I guess if you could start by explaining what you, how you would define CFI and DeFi. Great. Uh, thank you, Monica, firstly, and uh, excited, to, excited to be here. So yeah, jumping right into it, I think speaking about what CFI and DeFi is and then what we do to bridge it. CFI is a term we sort of coined on the go. Uh, it stands for centralized finance, and it refers to typically the things that you know people know when it comes to the term finance. So typically, I'm talking about your banking, your investments, your savings, and you know uh, financial instruments that are, that we are familiar with, like equities, stocks, um, you know, foreign exchange, things of that sort. So all of that broadly falls into what we call CFI, and then there's DeFi, which is decentralized finance, which is basically those same things, but on the chain or on the blockchain. Um, and more to do with the crypto assets that people hold, uh, that crypto investors hold. So again, things like lending, borrowing, uh, synthetics, which we'll probably get into a little later into this conversation as well, but synthetics, derivatives, all of these happening on the blockchain is what we refer to as decentralized finance. So where Comdex really comes in or what we're really trying to do at Comdex is build a range of solutions that can enable a bridging of these two universes, um, allowing people on either side to take exposure to what's happening on the other side. Um, hence the bridging of DeFi and CFI. Okay, that's a lot. So I think the bridging of CFI, it's good to even get a definition of that centralized finance, the finance that we're used to hearing about, even if not everybody's an options trader or a derivatives trader, et cetera. Um, we pretty much understand there's a stock market and some people engage that with all kinds of fancy instruments. Um, and I hear a lot about the SEC having um, kind of the purview over what happens in uh, centralized finance as well as in decentralized finance. And they, you know, that's where a lot of the um, restrictions can come, regulations can come. Um, they can also, they don't know what to say sometimes. So a lot of confusion can start there if you focus on what have they said? Nothing. Oh no, am I breaking the law? Maybe. It's like, you just don't <laughs> know, right? Um, yeah. But, you know, given the types of um, instruments that you're using, what I noticed in your bio that was really interesting that I, I'm totally confused about is um, how is it that you are more under the commodities de department versus the securities department? Because securities that goes under the SEC and FINRA, but commodities is kind of, you know, the, the SEC equivalent for commodities is really different. It's the, is it the CFTC or CFDC? That's One correct. CFTC. Yep. So what does that first, what does that even stand for? Um, um, I, I can't remember myself now. and derivatives, and financial derivatives commission or something. I don't know, but they're different. They I think, do yeah. completely different things, right? And they have different ideas about things. They have different rules. How is it that you guys ended up there? And maybe is this an idea that more crypto projects need to consider? So um, actually a lot of how we ended up with commodities has to do with our origins as a project. So maybe I'll, I'll start with that. So we started off ideating in 2017 or 20, late 2017 and early 2018 about what we can do with uh, you know the blockchain space and where it can be applied across multiple industries. Um, 2017, as most people might be familiar, was when the Bitcoin hit its previous, uh, previous peak of $20,000. So there was obviously a lot of buzz and a lot of excitement around this whole uh, you know, blockchain industry, this technology and what it can be used for. And around then is when I got in touch with uh, the folks who, who started off um, ideating for Comdex 
And these were people who were typically already operating in the commodity space with good footing in the industries and, and a good understanding of everything that goes on and the nuances of how to operate in this industry. And at the time, what they were looking for was a solution, a technological solution or a digital solution uh, that enables them to digitize their practices and at the same time tap into the efficiency and the transparency that comes with it. So that's when they sort of, um, or, or we sort of got in touch with each other. I was someone who was keen to learn about blockchain as well. And, uh, you know, these guys were my friends. So I, I told them, look, I want to be able to help you in any way that's possible. I want to learn myself and then also help you guys out in the process in whatever ways I can. So back then, uh, we started Comdex to build a, a platform which enables commodities traders to digitize their trading activities on the blockchain, which creates an immutable audit trail of all their transactions and their trading activities. And essentially what that does is enables them to position themselves as stronger business partners and business associates for their business associates to do business with. Um, because this is an industry that typically lacks trust and, um, you know, you know, players operating with one another in different jurisdictions, different parts of the world often find it hard to engage with new business associates simply because they don't trust who they're doing business with. So for enabling a trader to have an audit trail of all their trading activities on a, on a blockchain, which, which is public, transparent and immutable, creates that layer of trust that enables them now to, you know, reach out to these business associates and partners that they weren't reaching out to. Um, especially in financing, because this is a very capital, uh, working capital intense, intensive industry. So cash flows are of you know high importance. And um, a lot of these folks require, I mean, 80% of all trading volume that happens in a year requires financing. So we know that financing is a huge requirement. And we also figured that financing is a very underserved um, segment of this industry where more than 80% of these guys who actually do apply for financing are actually not getting the financing that they've applied for. So that was sort of the problem we wanted to address with Comdex back in 2017, 18. And um, of course, at the time, there was a buzz about what blockchain is, but not as much about crypto itself, yeah. especially with the institutional folks that we were talking to, because most of the clientele for our platform would be institutions and organizations based in different parts of Southeast Asia. So that's when we sort of realized that uh, the solution has to, has to solve these problems for this industry, create this blockchain solution, and then also address all the specific problems and nuances that this industry faces. And, you know, I mean, why, why commodities or how commodities largely have to do with the folks that I got in contact with when we started uh, Comdex. But, but commodities itself is a massive industry. You know, the, the average um, annual volume of trade that happens in commodities is estimated to be around $17 trillion, which is a huge number. And um, just in our day-to-day -day lives, I think we, in, we interact with commodities in so many different ways without realizing it. The, the PC that I'm using to speak to you right now has a bunch of parts that are you know, produced in different parts of the world, um, accumulated in pulp, and then you know, uh, circulated around the world. Everything, the, the chair and you know, this window, everything that I'm using here has got something to do with commodities or the other. So it's pretty much the lifeblood of global supply chain. And, and we figured, why not start there? Um, you know, that's a great starting point for adoption of blockchain, where you start at the fundamental layer of all the ingredients of everything that the world is made up of and digitize that and create a, you know, an immutable trail for all the transactions and activities that happen there. So that's, that's how we got into commodities. So that's why we focus on commodities, because we know it's a, it's a huge space. We know it's here to stay. Um, and as long as humanity exists, there's always going to be a demand for commodities. So why not? We you know, focus our energies on making this industry optimal and efficient in, in whatever ways we can. That's fantastic. So it really had more to do with what other people specifically were actually doing. And they said, let's just apply this technology in this direction because we know it really well. Absolutely, yeah. Now, had you been trading in the commodities world before? I realized that you have a background in investment banking. Was commodities a part of your background yourself or was it something that you really sort of had to pick up and learn? So I was uh, previously working at a big four uh, management consulting firm uh, in the investment banking arm of the firm, helping in due, di due diligence of, uh, you know, private equity transactions. Oh, that's so a lot of what I had to do. It's such a great way to, you know, question your own like reason for living. I mean, I just know so many people that have like bled their lives and souls in their twenties into these big fours and just come out like, I got to change my life. You know? <laughs> I mean, that's my story too. You know, I was, I was working there doing, all of these Excel sheets and, uh, and then PowerPoints. Uh, but I'm, in, in between all of the Excel sheets and PowerPoints, I actually got a great exposure to a bunch of different industries that I was doing due diligence for. 
So I wouldn't say commodities was a space I was particularly familiar with, but shipping was an industry that I had done, you know, a few projects with uh, for a few big clients that were based out of India at the time. So just through the little keyhole of exposure that I got uh, through the shipping industry into commodities is when I realized as well that this is an industry of massive scale. Uh, every transaction that these guys, you know, get into are typically seven to eight figures. So there's a lot, there's a lot of volume that moves around and a lot of critical uh, business functions that happens within this industry. So when I did get in contact with the guys who were ideating for Comdex and when they did say what they said, it all sort of just clicked in my head and made sense that, you know, this is something that can be addressed, that can be fixed and blockchain is prob- is most likely the way that it's going to happen. That's fantastic. And so what you really have is, is it an exchange platform or is it a, like a, what, what would a user get if they went to Comdex right now? If they don't really know commodities that well, is there a bit of like learning that goes into that? Or is it really just like for experts only a lot, like a lot of DeFi projects? Do you, do you try to engage the average consumer or do you really just focus on experts that are already in the commodity space or already in the DeFi space wanting exposure to commodities? Um, I would say a bit of both. So how it works is we have one platform that we launched in 2019, uh, which is a very enterprise focused platform, which as I said earlier in the call was designed for commodities trading institutions to digitize their activities and create that audit trail that helps them, you know, get uh, better access to financing and business. Uh, we have now focused, shifted our focus towards creating a protocol that enables DeFi investors to take exposure on the commodities side as well. And, and this application is expected to come live, uh, you know, in a couple of months from now, closer to end of February is, is, uh, is what I have in mind. And when a user goes to this application, it would typically be a DeFi investor or someone who holds crypto assets looking to take exposure in commodity assets like soybean, gold, silver, palm oil, uh, crude oil, um, you know, things of that sort. So the way it would work is pretty much you hold your crypto assets, you bring them to Comdex, you can collateralize them and then borrow against them. And this debt that you borrow could be in the form of, you know, um, some sort of stablecoin, or it could be in the form of assets, commodity assets that you can then trade on an exchange. Um, So these assets basically mimic the price of those commodities in the real world, but then you're able to take exposure to their price movements by holding and exchanging those assets on that exchange. So hence the name Comdex as well, right? It's commodities decentralized exchange. um, And that's really what we're going after. So, um, as I know this is a bit, may, might be on top, top, off, talk, off topic, but with a lot of people that are in the DeFi space and in crypto, um, we still talk a, quite a bit about how much inflation we're seeing in the US dollar and in most uh, fiat currencies right now. And we're going into sort of a global issue of, of massive inflation, but really specifically like the US is, is getting swallowed up into a black hole that way. And, and of course we've made yeah. our own bed to a degree. Um, then this might be off topic. If it is, maybe you don't have an answer for it, but I keep thinking, where do we go if we see the bear market is coming in crypto, if we see that fiat currencies are like evaporating into inflation and, you know, other than like just what you need to spend in the fiat currency in your local community or in your, in your personal life right away, where do you put your money to not kind of end up in this, in this black swan event of sorts that we all, maybe not black swans a bit too much to say, but this black hole that we really know can see is coming in the next just few months, if not within the next six to, to 12 months. So is commodities, I mean, I am of the mind that, well, one place to go is, you know, of course, into real estate, maybe it's into stable coins of high yield and DeFi, um, it's in different things, but is commodities, does that also kind of qualify in some sense as an investment banking and wealth management, you know, professional in, the, in your background, do you see commodities as a place where people could potentially um, shield themselves from some of the risk in fiat and cryptocurrencies that is coming? I'm glad you asked this question, actually, um, because, uh, you know, as you were asking me this question, it sort of, it was sort of was something I wanted to also bring up about how we ended up here. Um, and again, exactly as you pointed out, you know, I mean, the Fed itself has printed, I think, 25% of all the money that's in circulation in the last year alone. Um, reports are coming out now that uh, inflation in the U.S., which is 6.8%, is the highest it's been in, in a long time. I just heard um, 9.8%. I just heard 9.8% yesterday. Yeah. So they're probably yeah. starting to tell so, people, but I think that's not even a drop in the bucket. It's more than that. Absolutely. And, and you know, that's exactly what we realize is if money is losing value at this kind of pace, um, investors are seeking, you know, investment opportunities at all times. Um, if you also look at equity markets around the world, the U.S. equity markets have been doing pretty well recently. Um, I know in India, the equity markets are at a bull run as well. But when you study the fundamental economic data behind these economies, you, you, they sort of tell you a different story. 
um, which is why you almost feel as an investor that if I'm doing all this research and doing all this analysis and coming up with these hypotheses about where I should be investing, uh, the reality doesn't quite match up to what the fundamentals teach you. And that's where we thought about the investor thinking anyone who wants to diversify their portfolio and take you know, exposure in safer asset classes, where do they really go? Um, as you pointed out, the crypto bull run might not, you know, might, it's not going to last forever. We, we are going to have a bear market coming soon. Um, equity markets, you know, same, same story. I mean, we, we're seeing a bull run, but who knows, it might not last forever. Yep. Uh, money's losing value at a rapid pace. So as an investor, your, your focus should be towards preserving the value of the capital that you own. Um, and also in the long run, especially. So that's where an asset class like commodity comes into commodities comes into play because, um, you know, as I said, the demand for commodities is never dying. People are always going to want to eat. People are always going to want to, you know, have laptops and, and, and tables to sit on and chairs to sit on and things of all, all, everything of that sort. So we always, we realize that if you look at the price of any commodity in a long-term horizon, let's say 20 plus years, you see that there is a consistent sort of upward trend where it's able to beat inflation consistently over the long run. Really? So, yeah. So we see commodities as an asset class that's typically inflation resistance, uh, inflation resistant because they have an inherent value, uh, a tangible value that, that people use them for. And what we, what I see or, or what I saw as a finance professional before I got into, you know, Web3 is that um, commodities isn't really an asset class uh, for, for the retail investor. Um, people like you and I, we might be able to buy gold, but that's about as far as we can go with commodities. We're not able to take exposure in wheat and barley and, you know, um, corn and things of that sort. But we know these things are always in demand. So the focus has been towards tokenizing these or, you know, creating assets out of these, uh, these commodities that exist in the real world that people can invest in. Because we know that in the long run, these assets will all have value. There's always going to be some someone who's going to want to buy that corn and make, I don't know, conflicts out of it or something like that. Yeah. So that's that that was the underlying sort of hypothesis behind why we got into commodities as well is that it's it's an asset that can that has uh, you know the tendency to be inflation resistant but it's not been made an asset class that investors can invest in just yet so that's where we sort of fit in uh, in trying to make this an asset class that investors can invest in so one of the things I love about crypto in general is that in terms of asset classes and investment opportunities the little guy which is all of us except very few people on this planet really, uh, can actually finally take advantage of some of these opportunities. And that's because the increment of investment gets, has been lowered and the, and the um, barrier to entry in that sense, at least financially has been lowered. I, I appreciate that so much as I'm sure 99% of the world does too, if they only knew. Uh, I hope they, they get to know it more. That's why I'm in media about this. I'm like, let's shout it from the rooftops. There's opportunities. Let's take the money back from the monarchs. Come on, anyway. <laughs> But I'll get off that soapbox and onto another one. Um, so because of that barrier to entry that's been lowered, at least financially, on your platform, is it something that's really designed for DeFi experts? Or is it something where a retail investor who is in the, in the United States now can go, go through KYC, be approved, and begin you know, deploying their own small amounts of capital into this new asset class? So what we're building out now is our synthetics protocol. Um, We'll get into what it does, but broadly speaking, it's just creating tokens or derivatives of commodities in the real world that crypto investors can invest in. So this application is fully decentralized, meaning anyone in the world should be able to use this application to with their crypto assets to do you know whatever they wish to do uh, as long as the platform allows it. But in terms of our roadmap in the long run, we have plans to uh, tokenize debt assets from commodities industry in the real world and bring them on chain and allow DeFi investors to take exposure to these assets and these debt assets in particular. Uh, typically, these are safe debt assets, uh, which we don't have you know, any exposure to or any uh, sort of insight into at all. So yes, we want to you know, make this, this app, which is, which is gonna be called Shipfy launching in 2022. Uh, this app will, will be, thank you. So uh, this app will be for, you know, as you described, the average investor who's able to do the KYC, able to you know, register themselves on this application and then through their crypto stable, let's say uh, stable assets like USDT or you know any other stable coin, take exposure um, in the real world on these debt assets. So yes, that is in the works. It's part of the roadmap. But what we're launching uh, now in um, in a couple of months' time, uh, around Feb 2022, is is the application that's fully decentralized uh, for any DeFi user to take exposure. That's fantastic. Um, so, I guess for my listeners, if you are aware of Comdex, you can check them out now, but really the product that's going to be 
addressed and, and really speaking to you is going to be out more like Q1, Q2, 2022, which is an exciting thing because I think given my my general ideas on how you know, the crypto mar bear market and all other bear markets are coming, we probably have, we're going to, we're going to be like pretty hungry for that opportunity, I think pretty soon. Um, but I also have to wonder, you know, if the timing of that, with the timing of that being kind of, it sounds like it's going to be really well-timed given that people are going to have an appetite for some op alternatives. Is this something that you're already seeing? I'm trying to relate this sort of to the mortgage-backed securities market where there's already enterprise interest. There's already, you know, large funds, you know, packaging up mortgages and calling them AAA, rating them, and then swapping them back and forth, right? There's a bond market for this. There's a, there's a good market for this. And there's very little transparency as we know, and we had to pay for dearly with our 2008 crash. And hopefully we can avoid that in the future with blockchain in that particular area as well. It's something that I've really thought deeply about that, you know, if we can begin with an enterprise solution on that end, tokenizing all of the actual assets, then also we can bring it to investors on the other end and hopefully help to, you know, change up how their mortgage structures are or give them the chance to do new and maybe even more affordable ways to stay in their homes. So this is something that I'm very interested in because I think of what you're doing is sort of analogous to what I've always thought of in, in terms of what's happening and what's brewing in the crypto markets in terms of real estate. So am I getting this right that it's sort of like, if you know real estate already, and nobody knows the commodities market this way that you guys do, right? That's a lot more fringe. Even the, the mortgage-backed securities market is something that people, you know, might watch the big short and be like, huh, that's a thing? I didn't know. That's how I felt. Yeah. Most people probably felt that way. But I have never once seen the big short equivalent of, you know, wheat and barley debt, <laughs> you know? So is it sort of analogous to that? Is it, is it, does it operate similarly? And if so, like, I'm so curious how you were able to become useful to, the enterprise world um, and those traders in there because, you know, blockchain just seems like it is uh, Japanese. It is like another language nobody spe that, that, that no one has really has learned in that market, right? Um, not to say no one's learned Japanese. All the Japanese people have and lots of other people do. But, you know, I <laughs> yeah. wonder, is it sort of like that? Is that how it functions? Um, interesting. You, bring, you, uh, you know, you mentioned something a little earlier uh, and it, it's pretty much what we actually plan to do. So um, as I mentioned a little earlier on, we have the enterprise focus application. Uh, the way this application works is anytime there's a commodity that's being traded between two parties in the real world, we capture the documents that you know, specify what this commodity is and we create an NFT of this document and then store it on our chain. So what that does is it's a unique, it's a unique asset that represents that particular shipment of commodity that exists you know, on whatever vessel or whatever port it's currently sitting at. This NFT then exists on the chain, giving a transparent insight into who owns this asset right now and how many hands it has changed before it's reached you and all, all the sort of yes. insight that you need. So there is that layer of transparency that exists for this NFT or for this commodity asset that exists in the real world. Um, we focus on making all our applications interoperable, which means every app we make should be able to communicate with every other app we make, um, you know, allowing that synergy to exist along across different uh, user classes that we deal with. So in a utopian scenario, when all our applications are up and running and you know the, the, the app is really being used to its full potential, what we can see is commodity assets being traded by commodity traders on the enterprise side, creating NFTs, which represent those assets in the real world, which we store on the chain. And then through apps like Shipify, what we'll allow these, these, guys, uh, these commodity traders to do is seek financing on these trades through Shipify, where this NFT is now stored on Shipify as, as the collateral against which, is, which a derivative is created. And this derivative represents that same commodity debt asset that these commodity traders are seeking financing for. And these derivatives can then be sold to DeFi investors who use their stable assets or you know, crypto assets to buy these derivatives. And then that channels the funds back to the financing requirement originally created by the commodities traders. So in a sense, there's a very transparent view into everything that's gone into the into the creation of the NFT, into the creation of the financing request and the fulfillment of that financing request uh, for each DeFi investor that's involved. Um, so yes, it, it is far more, I would say far more transparent than how things were done in the 2008 crisis because back then it was centralized. You were relying on um, you know, firms like Moody's to, to provide these ratings. Um, and there was no insight into how a AAA was different from any other rating. You know, it was, it was sort of just the rating was given out. Everyone took the rating at face value and then acted on that basis. Here, what we want to do is empower all investors with the right tools that they need to have complete insight into everything that's going on at the back end and make their investment decisions accordingly and uh, hopefully take more informed decisions uh, going forward as well. And then speaking of the commodities industry itself, you know, 
historically it's an industry with very low default rates when it comes to the debt uh, that's in the industry typically the industry gets a bad rap because when there are these defaults they, they tend to be public and they tend to be of huge size yeah. and that's why there's sort of this air around commodities to debt that it's a, that it's you know it's an unsafe asset but if you look at the statistics purely uh, it's a very safe asset class to be invested in and that's that's again our hypothesis is that um, if we give investors access to these kind of assets they can truly diversify their portfolio to go for an all weather portfolio or all weather defi investments um, is what we allow what we want to allow investors to have is that no matter whether it's a bull or a bear you still have ways to protect your capital you know uh, leverage up on your capital hedge hedge your positions and also just take exposure in in safe assets that that you otherwise wouldn't have had access to that makes a lot of sense so it seems to me that as a as a smaller investor as a retail investor etc the meet most of my listeners um there's really not something that we can go out and do right now except potentially look at your your utility coin that you do have that you have put out on, and it's now listed so can you tell us a little bit about that listing it looks like it's on the osmosis decks and you know, to somebody who's like a layman, what does that what does that mean, and how would someone find it? Yeah, so yeah, as you mentioned rightly, we're now listed on Osmosis. We actually went live just a few weeks ago. Oh. Um, our to- our token is called CMDX, and uh, it's being built on top of the Cosmos SDK. Cosmos is the technological layer one that we're built on top of. So that's the ecosystem we operate in, and Osmosis is a decentralized exchange in that ecosystem. So anyone looking to you know get involved in this ecosystem would typically um, have to be on the Osmosis Dex to find all these different uh, tokens that are traded there, uh, like ours. And and um, you know part of our roadmap is to have our token listed across multiple exchanges, centralized exchanges as well, so we can capture a broader audience that you know would be interested in a product that we're building and interested in using something like uh, what we're working for. So yeah, more updates on that should be coming, you know, from our channels uh, pretty soon. But anyone looking to find to you know get involved at this point, uh, Osmosis is where we're currently uh, listed. Fantastic, and it sounds like some people got involved before even the Osmosis listing, and you had some airdrops. Can you tell me? A lot of my listeners have heard about airdrops. I mean, the word comes up, but can you talk about what that program was? Who got involved? How they got there? And now, what that means to the people that that did engage with it? Yeah, yeah. So airdrop is um, basically an incentivization program. You can you can say uh, what we want to do is uh, you know sort of at least for from the context of what we did at Comdex was we've been operating in the Cosmos ecosystem for two years, sort of mostly in the shadows. You know, more public uh, recently, but we've had a lot of support from from the ecosystem and from everyone involved across the space. So in many ways, part of the part of why we did the airdrop was to give back to the community for all its support that it's been providing us. You know, in the past two years. But also is it's it's to raise awareness to incentivize certain uh, you know behaviors that we we encourage, and then also just to capture the attention from different uh, e- ecosystems that we believe there are synergies with. So that's why we chose Atom, uh, Luna, Osmo, and XPRT. Um, these are the tokens for uh, Cosmos. The Cosmos token is Atom, Luna is for Terra, Osmo is for Osmosis, and XPRT is for Persistence. Um, and what we have done is we've airdropped CMDX, our token, to stakers and holders of these assets. Uh, the reason being, and, and more so to stakers than to the holders, the reason being, of course, we, we promote staking of assets because they help secure the chain. Um, and why Cosmos is, uh, as I said, we're part of the ecosystem. And, you know, it's always great to have the support of the ecosystem and always great to give back to the, to the community as a whole as well. Same thing goes for Osmosis. You know, it's uh, it's it's great what they've done for Cosmos as a whole. Uh, ever since the Dex has come up, we've seen this uh, you know whole boom on boom on the DeFi side of things as well. So uh, Terra, because now they've recently become IBC enabled, so as a welcome to the IPC family, and also you know for for potential interaction, uh, you know, integrations with them in the future, potential synergies with them in the future as well. It was all it's a great opportunity to have uh, interactions with Luna holders who are from the Terra community. And then, um, of course, persistence, because, you know, we built our first application using the persistence SDK, very much a part of the persistence ecosystem and, and had, have had great support from the persistence community as a whole. So, you know, again, that was the reason uh, the airdrop was conducted for these four communities. And then, yeah, for uh, for anyone looking to find out how much they're eligible for or how they can go about claiming the airdrop, um, they can head over to airdrop.com dex.1. Um, that's where, you know, you can find out how much you're eligible for. And if you are eligible, you can start claiming. Uh, so all the information can be found there. 
That's fantastic. And um, actually, you should put that in the chat so I can grab it. I'm going to make sure that we put it in our show notes and people can go to it. Yeah. Um, airdrop.com slash CMDX. It's airdrop.comdex.one. Comdex.1. Okay. Yeah. Um, that's not so bad. Uh, let's see. I have, I have so many other questions, but they're not like, we've just gone down different rabbit holes and I'm like, how do we come back to like the most important things? Um, I guess really, I, I also want to just know, how did you decide, like, what did you study in school and what got you into, um, like, how did that go between what you studied in school? How did it apply to being at the big four where you might've lost your soul, may or may, or may not have lost your soul for a moment, or at least a few brain cells. And then, um, you know, how did that, how do you feel like that set you up to be where you are? A lot of our listeners are crypto enthusiasts, they're millennials, they're Zoomers, and, you know, trying to figure that out and feel like you have a plan when it seems impossible to ever have a plan. I always like to sort of pull that curtain back if I can. No, I mean, happy to go into, into my background. So I'm, I'm from, uh, you know, I did my undergrad in economics and finance from McGill University, which is in Montreal, Canada. Um, soon after that, I started my career, um, you know, by starting my own business right after college, which is a wealth management practice that I started off my own. Um, of course, it didn't last too long. And of course, it came crashing to the ground. But I have no regrets because I learned a lot uh, through doing that. Uh, and soon after, I jumped into, you know, doing my investment banking role at the, the big four consulting firm that I was at. And uh, that was a firm I'd previously worked with as an intern. So I had relations with the team that I was working there. And they always had, we always had good relations. And, you know, there was always some interest to work together in the future. And that's when I got back there. And as you rightly said, you know, uh, working in that sort of takes your soul away from you when you realize that um, it, it's not all that you dream, dreamt about when you first start working. And, and around then is also when I started reading about crypto and everything that's happening on the crypto side of things. I saw a few people make a lot of money. Um, that was one of the primary reasons my, you know, my ears sort of uh, just fucked up when I heard about crypto and I was like, oh, I need to know what's going on here. So I started reading up a lot, um, got in touch with a few friends of mine who are in the space and, and learned a lot through them. And then, yeah, that's, that's when I, through them, also got in touch with, you know, the folks who were ideating for Comdex and they were, they were talking about blockchain and how they can apply it. So that's how I really got in. But um, what I feel about this space, which is a, which is a, you know, very beautiful thing about this industry is that it's, it's truly decentralized in the sense that um, I always say to be a doctor, you need a, you know, you need a degree, which, which puts you in college for, I don't know, I don't even know how many years. And at the end of it, you're pretty much 30, 35. And then that's when they tell you, okay, now you can go be a doctor. Um, if you want to be a chartered accountant, you need to you know, clear certain exams and uh, do certain degrees. And only then does, do you get the license to be a chartered accountant. Uh, the beauty of the crypto industry is there's no university in the world that's giving out crypto degrees. Um, there's no company that's saying you can't be in this space if you don't have a crypto degree because it doesn't exist. So truly speaking, anyone who's in this industry is here because they just wanted to learn. And then they, they spent that effort and then they found everything they needed to find to learn. And it's all available freely online. Yeah. And the crypto community as a whole is such an accepting um, and warm community. You know, everyone's DMs are pretty much open. Anytime you DM anyone in the industry, uh, you can expect them to reply. You can expect them to help you out, provide you resources that you need to learn. And, and that's the beauty of this space. And, and that's how I learned um, what I learned about this industry is just honestly through, through finding things online that, that you know, interested me. And, and my effort is to pass it on. Um, so as I, and my, day, my DMs are always open for anyone who wants to learn about crypto. Um, I'm always happy to provide the resources as I was helped very you know, generously in my early days. So that, that's truly the beauty of the space is that anyone who truly wants to learn will, will, will find a way to learn here. Yeah, absolutely. I couldn't have said it better myself. It's a, it's a really supportive environment. The community is amazing. Having been a woman in tech kind of back in the you know, mid to late aughts and then being like, oh, I got to get out of there and doing my own thing for a while and coming back. This is a whole new game. I mean, it's just, it is so much more welcoming and open to absolutely anyone. And in fact, I think I, what I've heard from most people, the crypto bros that I that I have know way too many of, of course, they say, you know, how are we going to get, will you please help us get more women into crypto? We need more people of color in crypto. We like, everybody should be in here. This is the biggest wealth transfer that we're seeing in modern history and all of human history. Get them in here. Otherwise it'll be just the same all over again. And, you know, it's like that kind of ground up and decentralized effort to, to really help out and, and engage and be available to your fellow man is something that I've just always loved about the crypto community. So thank you for making your DMs available for sure. That's, I mean, that kind of goes without saying so many, you're right. So many people, almost everyone is really available and ha happy to help and not just evangelize, but actually mentor. So thank you for that. I'm sure you're going to get a couple of, uh, of 
questions about that and about any future airdrops that may happen and you know your coin and everything else. So this is exciting. And I really hope we have a round two uh, when you actually launch the product in February, March. That sounds wonderful. It'd be great to hear more about how things have, have progressed and then help to, to get this thing, you know, more and more eyeballs on it because it sounds like a fantastic place to be securing investment and hopefully um, outperforming some of this inflation that's coming our way. <laughs> Absolutely. Thanks, Monica. I mean, uh, really look forward to that as well. Fantastic. Yeah, I, I just can't wait. And um, I realize the time we usually uh, try to keep these somewhere under 30 minutes and we're going to easily go over that. So I think I'm going to try to <laughs> cut it short this time and save some of my questions for round two. Um, but do you have anything else that you want to make sure you announce before we before we sign off together? Um, I mean, yeah, uh, as I said earlier in the call, the airdrop uh, is now live for claiming. So anyone who is interested to claim their airdrop can head over to airdrop.com, one. Um, and just generally, I think uh, the best way to know anything about what's going on in our project is our website itself, which is one. And then from there, you can make your way to, you know, our community chat on Telegram, our Twitter page. Um, you know, our Twitter DMs are open. Our community chat has a lot of helpful community members itself who would probably help you out before the team can. Uh, so it's a beautiful environment that way and then always open for you know people to come get involved in the community ask their questions um, and if anyone wants to get involved in other ways as well you know any member of the team is open to to chat about those things so yeah um, that's I think uh, pretty much it from our end and more updates will be uh, you know shared from all our channels so just stay tuned all right. Well, thank you so much for all the information. This has been our first ever, I think this is the first time we've really dived into the, uh, anything about the commodities world. So I'm very excited to see these synthetics and derivatives and opportunities for people in the commodities world. I am going to personally be investigating this because it sounds like a great place for me to invest some money as well. So thank you again, um, Sid. This is Sid Patil from uh, Comdex. He's a co-founder and COO. And uh, it's just been a real pleasure talking with you. Thank you so much, Sid. Thank you, Monica. Likewise, it was a pleasure. Well, um, I'm going to sign off. This was the New Trust Economy. And thank you for listening. And I will catch you on the next episode. Talk to you soon. You've been listening to the New Trust Economy. We'd love to hear your comments on today's show, as well as suggestions for future topics and guests. Visit us online at newtrusteconomy.com or on social at newtrusteconomy. Thanks for exploring the new trust economy with us.